On this episode of Doing the Most, we are making a mead inspired by the brand new Zelda game, Tears of the Kingdom. Moment brews and various artists, everything from me to rose. Big creation, fermentation, and heat creation, doing the most. It's finally here. The long-awaited sequel to Breath of the Wild. Anna is super stoked. She pre-ordered it, so it's probably here at the time that you're watching this video. We probably have already played it a little bit. And I wanted to do a mead inspired by the new game using some ingredients that are featured in Breath of the Wild and probably in Tears of the Kingdom too. Those ingredients are coarser bee honey, which we're gonna use wildflower for. And there are apples in the game, so we're gonna be using apple juice. And wild berry, which we're going to use blackberry as our wild berries in this recipe. So this is a mead made with apple juice, so technically it is a sizer. However, we are fruiting it with blackberries, so it's also technically a melamel. We're gonna call it a blackberry sizer. This is going to be sweet when we're done with it, it's gonna be carbonated, and it's going to be done in about six weeks. So you can do this even if you're a brand new beginner. A couple of things about this recipe. We are using bread yeast because that's beginner friendly and because I've done some testing to determine which bread yeast I like. And also we're not gonna be recommending using mead nutrients. Now, please go watch my video on mead nutrition. You will learn from that video that I absolutely believe that we need nutrients in our mead making, but in an effort to make this beginner friendly, we are doing it at a low ABV, so that way fermentation kinetics are more favorable to a complete ferment. And we're putting a ton of fruit in there, so we're also loading a bunch of nitrogen in. Yes, it's not enough nitrogen to meet the yen requirements for the yeast, but if you're a brand new mead maker, that's probably gobbledygook to you. Anyway, so let's take a look at our recipe. The ingredients for our Tears of the Kingdom mead are one pound of honey, one gallon of apple juice, three pounds of blackberries, a packet of bread yeast, and for finishing, we'll be using 12 ounces of erythritol and one teaspoon of sugar per bottle to carbonate. Pretty simple, right? So let's take a look at how it's made. We're gonna start by making sure everything is sanitized. I'm using a no rinse sanitizer called Starzan, and it's exactly how it sounds. You mix it up, you dunk all your tools in it or spray them with a spray bottle full of Starzan, and it's no rinse. So once it touches them, you just shake off the excess and you're good to go. Once I've got that mixed up, I went ahead and put it into another bucket because I had mixed it up in the bucket I'm gonna to use to ferment, hashtag hacks. We're gonna be using a straining bag. This is a nylon straining bag. This one's reusable. And we're going to be putting our blackberries in the straining bag so that way we can lift all of the fruit out at a later time and leave less gunk forming in the bottom of our fermentation bucket. So once the bag is thoroughly sanitized, we will clip it with some sanitized clips to the edge of our bucket and get our blackberries in. We're using a pretty high fruit load of blackberries here, meaning they are gonna drop a lot of sediment. And so even though we're using a straining bag to get most of the solids out, while in secondary, you're still going to see a lot of sediment form at the bottom. That's okay, it just contributes to a little bit of extra loss when you're bottling. Get all of our blackberries in there. And then we're going to tie that bag off with a loose knot, you know, where we can unknot it later when we're ready to get the fruit back out of it. Then our honey goes in. I'm just pouring it right on top of the fruit there. And then our apple cider goes in. We're going to start by using it to get the remainder of the honey out of that measuring cup there. And then we'll dump the rest in on top. Now you're gonna to wanna to mix this around pretty well to make sure that the honey combines with the cider. And you're also gonna to wanna to be squeezing the fruit bag to make sure you're squeezing as much of the juice out of those blackberries as possible. You really wanna get everything combined. 
And then I would typically recommend EC1118 wine yeast for beginners, but here we're gonna use my favorite bread yeast, one in a mill, and uh, this yeast will do the job. I've tested a bunch of different bread yeasts and I found that this one has the cleanest, tastiest flavor profile versus all the other bread yeast I've tried. So we're gonna use that one to make this recipe a little bit beginner friendly, but if you have access, I would recommend using a wine yeast instead. And then our sanitized lid goes on. And our sanitized airlock goes on, and that's filled with sanitizer. You could also fill it with water or with vodka. Then I'm just writing on there what is inside the bucket. This is our Tears of the Kingdom mead, a blackberry sizer. A few hours later, I took a refractometer reading, and as you can see, our gravity was 1.073, kind of in the range of 1.074, if we're being honest. We used a refractometer three hours into fermentation to check our gravity. That's because at about three hours, I'm pretty comfortable that all of the sugars have meshed together. That is the honey and the juice from the fruit mixing with the apple juice, the apple cider that we have in there fermenting. And that's gonna give me a pretty good read on potential alcohol by volume. I'm using a refractometer for this, but you could use a hydrometer, which is an inexpensive but $10 tool where you would pull a sample into a graduated cylinder and then read your gravity with that hydrometer. And that would tell you the density of your liquid, therefore the potential alcohol by volume of your final mead. I used a refractometer here because I have one and because it's easy. <laughs> However, it's pretty difficult to use a refractometer for your final gravity reading. There's a lot of math that has to be done. So I do recommend having a hydrometer, especially because there's no way of knowing this finished fermenting unless you stick a hydrometer in and test to make sure that it is finished. And for something like this, it's probably gonna fall around 1.000 or slightly lower when it's finished. That said, if you're a beginner mead maker, you may not have a hydrometer or you may not be ready to purchase one yet. In that case, go with an abundance of caution. Let this ferment for four or five weeks and taste it, tasting for the sweetness to be gone. Now, this is not foolproof, and that's why I always urge new brewers to buy a hydrometer, and especially a polycarbonate hydrometer. Every day for one week, we're gonna open it up and use a sanitized implement, here I'm using a spoon, to press the bag down and make sure that the bag stays wet. And this is just to prevent it from drying out on top, which can be a vector for mold and other infections, so we just wanna keep that bag soaked. A week later, we're gonna remove the fruit bag entirely. So I'm just gonna use some sanitized gloves, pull that bag out, and squeeze as much of the juice out of the bag as I can. And uh, this is gonna introduce a little bit of oxygen, but there's still some fermentation to go on here. We're gonna let this ferment for another couple of weeks, and so the yeast will eat up that oxygen, but we do wanna pull the solids out because blackberries have seeds. And while we do want to extract some of those herbal tannins from the seeds and the blackberries, we don't want to over extract either. So it's time to get that fruit out of there. And about two weeks later, we're going to get this racked off into a sanitized carboy so that way we can cold crash it. Cold crashing works by basically slowing everything down inside your brew. So the yeast that kind of churn with turbidity and move things around and cloud up your mead, they can be slowed down by some cold temperature. So putting it in the fridge for a few days kind of puts everything into hibernation and a lot of that stuff will fall to the bottom of your carboy or your bucket. So it makes it easier for you to rack off. It's always best if you can rack off and leave as much of the sediment in your carboy as possible. So we're using a siphon to transfer our mead from primary to secondary. That's from our bucket to our carboy. This is a comically oversized five gallon auto siphon. This might be similar to what you see on Amazon or at your local homebrew shop. And you just pump it once or twice and that starts a vacuum that then allows gravity to transfer your mead as long as the one you're transferring from is higher than the one you're transferring to. We've got a whole video on how to transfer your homebrew. Check out that video for more details. Then it's bottling day about two weeks later. We're adding our erythritol to the bucket and this is going to be a non-fermentable sweetener. So this will be a slightly sweet drink. 
and we're racking on top of that so that way we can mix the erythritol throughout make sure it's sweetened all the way through the batch and a little gentle stirring until you don't feel any crystals at the bottom will tell you that it's ready you can see here as we move into the bottling phase that we are racking into a separate container why are we doing that it's because we're going for a clean rack we want to leave all the sediment we can behind and this also allows for our mead to mix with our back sweetening erythritol and kind of become homogenous in a way that's difficult if you're trying to sweeten in the fermentation vessel itself. To get a clean product in bottles, it's really important to do a clean rack on your bottling day. And then I'm priming my bottles with a teaspoon of granulated sugar. This is just table sugar, and that goes right into each bottle before bottling. This sugar will be eaten up by the yeast and converted to CO2, and that CO2 will go into suspension inside the drink, making it carbonated, meaning you will have a sparkling blackberry sizer. Refreshing. Then we're just gonna use a bottling wand to get that bottled up. The bottling wand has a valve on it, and when you press it down while the mead is moving through the siphon, it will open up and bottom fill your bottles. This gives you a lot of control over filling your bottles versus trying to open and close a valve on an actual tube or just quickly trying to move it from bottle to bottle. If you don't have a bottling wand, it's one of the best investments you can make in your home brewing kit. Once bottled, these need to sit at a warm room temperature of 70 to 75 degrees or so, so that way the yeast can continue working and carbonate those drinks for us. And there you have it, 10 bottles of Blackberry Sizer. I'm gonna cut in here just to recommend that you sweeten this to your palate preference. So sweeten it, maybe use half of what I recommend, taste it, and then adjust based on your taste, understanding that the carbonation in here is gonna cut that sweetness just a little bit. So you wanna push the sweetness just a little bit past what you think is perfect. All right, we're done. We've made the mead. We've let it bottle condition for about a month. It may take six weeks or more. And I do have a video that explains how to use a test bottle to check for carbonation. If you've never done bottle conditioning before, you should check that out. So from this batch, ours have been going in the bottle, conditioning, carbonating up for about four weeks. It's time to crack one open and see how it tastes. All right, here we go. got a very delicate petalant sparkle to it. It might be hard to see in the light in here, but I can see little bubbles trickling up to the top of the glass. Now this could probably go for another couple weeks. That might sparkle it up a little bit more, but I like this nice little steady trickle of bubbles I'm seeing at the surface. Let's take a taste. It tastes like blackberry cider but with just a little touch of honey in there. Now the blackberry seeds do contribute some tannin and that tannin is a little bit herbal, which I think is really fun and kind of fits with the vibe of mead making in the countryside in a dystopian fantasy world. The nose is all apple. Don't pick up a lot of the blackberry on the nose. But there's a nice interplay between the cider and the blackberry where they kind of help balance each other out. And then that little kind of ribbon of tannin that runs through there kind of helps it cling around the mouth. But that little bit of sweetness that's in there helps amplify those fruity flavors. But you still have just a little bit of that fun kind of fermentation funky flavor in there that lets you know this is fermented. This is not just blackberry juice and apple juice mixed together. Now I will say doing this a couple times without the nutrient, there were definitely some smells coming out of the fermenters. And that's typically due to how apple juice ferments. A lot of times it can have some sulfury smells. And if yours get that, like if you're not using nutrient, don't be alarmed. That should age out as the mead continues to off gas out of the fermenter. So where you might think you're done in six weeks, it might actually take eight or nine weeks just to let those smells kind of come up and out the airlock. Overall, it's a delicious and fruity and delicate mead. I really like how it presents and I really like how simple it is because I think as far as beginner recipes go, especially when you're carbonating something, this is 
pretty chill. If you like this video, you should check out our videos on the Valheim meads. We did a couple videos on those with similar delicious, tasty results. Get it? It's, it's, the, it's the tasty mead. If you like this video, also please subscribe so that way you don't miss out on our future content and join our Discord community. There's lots of great homebrewers there ready and willing to help out the beginner. Until next time, happy brewing, stay safe, and cheers.